All right. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, my name is Kristen Hoffman. I'm the director of the Autism Center at Misericordia, and I'm excited to be here with uh, Sandy Kirchner, who is um, at the Hazleton Autism Family Support Hub. And together, um, we wanted to bring this webinar to, um, to educators, caregivers, and families as we are all trying to navigate this new um, educational experience that our kids are having. Um, so we are going to have three panelists speak to you. Um, during the time, you can ask any questions that you might have by writing them in the chat box. And I will be keeping track of those questions. And at the end, I will ask all of the questions that you might have um, to our panelists. Um, and I guess that we will get started. Sam, if you want to start us off. Sure. Just give me a second here and I will share my screen. Okay, there we go. Hello everyone, my name is Samantha Pavic. I am an elementary school teacher. Um, just a little bit about me, my background. I went to Wilkes University, graduated with a bachelor's degree in elementary education. I'm certified kindergarten through sixth grade. I have experience as a TSS worker for many years, um, specifically with for children with autism. I also was a second grade teacher, a fifth grade teacher. I have a few years of experience as an online ESL teacher for VIP Kid. Uh, that's what I'm currently doing. I'm working from home, teaching ESL online. I'm also homeschooling my almost five-year-old daughter and we have a new baby in the house, three month old. Um, so it's a little crazy here, but <laughs> that seems to be the case in most households now <laughs> with the whole switch to distance learning. So hopefully I can offer you some tips um, as teachers, uh, maybe some tips for families and students as well as we navigate this new adventure. <laughs> so let's get started. So we're going to start with talking about your visual learners. So engaging your visual learners. These are your students who learn best by seeing information. So that could be written information, typed information, your PowerPoint presentations. They like charts and webs to organize information, maps and pictures and videos, flashcards, all of those uh, visually stimulating things to engage those types of learners. So something I've learned from my online teaching experience with VIP Kid is to use a lot of props. So teachers, if you have your own children, this is where I'm going to give you permission to go ahead and steal all of their toys, because that's what I've done with my daughter, um, to use as props in class. Kids love to see physical objects in class when you're explaining um, new concepts or even reviewing concepts. They like to see tangible objects. Um, so creating that visual engagement through props, that could be your mini whiteboard if you're explaining um, different rules of vowels, you can write it out on your board, practice breaking down words. Um, just another prop that you can kind of incorporate for those visual learners. You can also, if you see that maybe your students are starting to lose their attention a little bit with sitting and just looking and listening um, to a lesson, you might want to use props to kind of grab that attention back or gain their attention back if they're getting a little antsy. Um, but you can use a prop to kind of engage them, pull them in back into your lesson, give them something to visually focus on. Let's talk about the parts, the body parts. These are the ears. Let's look at his nose. So you want to kind of draw their attention into those details of the prop that you're using to kind of settle them back in and refocus their attention. So props are great. Use all of the props that you can get your hands on. <laughs> Next would be visual cues. And I have a picture here of some, just an example that I found. Um, I've seen these around Facebook a lot. Um, teachers are getting really creative now with the online learning. They're creating these great little visual props and cues um, that are really helpful for students, especially if you have a lot of uh, repetitive directions that you want them to follow or instructions for them to follow. Hold up that prop card, that visual cue card, that picture card um, while you're giving 
giving your instructions or your directions or pin them on your PowerPoint so they can look at the pictures and see visually first I need to do this, then I need to do this. Um, this could be used even for, you know, cut and color, then glue, you know, any of those pictures that you can find um, to go along as a, as a visual cue for your uh, lesson. Also, creating an engaging classroom environment, even if you're not in your classroom. Uh, if you're at home teaching, you can create uh, an engaging background, you know, using very simple items that you might have around the house. My background is just a, um, like a, a, a rolling wardrobe or garment cart with a piece of fabric thrown over it. Um, I made a little banner, hung up some colorful little pom-poms, um, and I used a, a letter chart from the Dollar Tree. So just a few little, few little things to make it feel um, like a classroom, look engaging, gain their interests, but it's not overly done. You don't wanna create something that's too visually stimulating um, that it would become distracting to the students. So try to keep it simple, but fun. Also, I have found that digital rewards are, go over very well uh, with students. Um, something that I have learned to use, I did not know about this or use them before I started online teaching, um, but Google Slides, you can create some really awesome digital rewards. Um, I actually taught myself on YouTube how to put these rewards together. So you can search on YouTube how-to videos uh, to make digital rewards for your students using Google Slides, if that's something that you have access to. And if I can, I'm going to try to share that really quick. Just to show you a quick example of what you can do. Can you all see the numbers on the screen? Okay, I didn't know if it shared the correct screen. Let me see if I can switch that really quick. Here we go. Okay, now can you see the numbers on the screen? Okay, perfect. So this is an example of a digital reward that I use called Find a Star. So you can use this during a lesson. Maybe you have a lengthy lesson and you kind of want to break it down or chunk it into smaller parts um, for your students so they don't get exhausted <laughs> through the lesson. So maybe every five minutes you stop and you pull up your digital reward and you can call on a student to pick a number. Um, there are hidden pictures behind these numbers and there are hidden stars behind the numbers. So for my my students in VIP Kid, I tried to encourage them to find the stars. They, there are five stars that are hidden and I try to encourage them to find the five stars before the end of our class. So it's just kind of a built-in reward system for them. Um, it's motivating, it keeps them engaged and interested, but it kind of breaks up the lesson a little bit. Every few slides of our lesson, lesson we'll stop and, and pick a number. Um, so it kind of keeps that motivation and momentum going for them. So if the student says, oh, well, let's pick number eight, let's see what's here. Oh, you found a star, great job. So maybe you can build in some kind of reward for them or you can use this uh, um, and tailor it to your classroom, however you wanna set up your reward system. Um, it can just be a fun game that you do and they don't get anything other than the excitement of you know, finding the stars or you can tie it to something else. It's really customizable with however you want to use it in your classroom. So really fun game. I will go back. Let's see if I can do this now. Here we go. Okay. Now let's go on to um, your auditory learners. These are your students that learn best by listening to information. So this could be lecture, discussion and conversation. It could be songs, audio recordings. These students are um, really going to be engaged by listening to you explain concepts to them, having them explain concepts to their peers uh, to summarize information. Um, really using those songs as an, another engaging component. So maybe you wanna open up your lesson and, and gain their attention by using a song that talks about a concept that you're introducing that day. So reading materials allowed for them, reading your instructions allowed for them, also including those pictures for your visual learners, you're tapping into both types of um, visual and auditory learners um, in one lesson. 
create opportunities for them to collaborate with their peers, um, have group discussions. So allow them to speak often in class, not just sit and listen for long periods of time. Try to have them interact throughout the lesson by speaking. So you want to really avoid those long periods of silence, um, use shorter learning intervals, use brain breaks or those digital rewards to kind of break up those lessons, have the students speaking, um, interacting through verbalization. Also, you can record yourself or your lessons um, or record yourself giving instructions so that they can go back and replay it and listen to it as they need to. You can also turn this around and encourage them to record themselves when they're reading to themselves at home or reading or reviewing information, have them record themselves and then listen back to it as a review. You can use songs to teach your concepts have students create their own songs, get their creative juices flowing with um, creating their own rhythms, their own tunes, their own songs. Um, I also like the idea of choice boards that you can really tap into your learners um, and really differentiate your um, uh, assessment options with them so they can choose the type of um, project that they want to use to show their understanding of a concept. So they can choose to make a song or they can choose to give an oral report, whatever taps into that um, learning ability that they most uh, are comfortable with. So those choice boards are great to use um, to allow them to make a, a choice for their learning. Also, having them repeat keywords and phrases, hearing themselves repeat that, you repeating it, and find different and fun ways to have them repeat it. So instead of me just saying it and you repeating it, we'll have them use different voices to repeat. You can use loud voices and soft voices or fast and slow. Uh, my kids like to do different robot voices or Batman voices. And so you can get really creative with all of those things. Have your kids give you some ideas about how they wanna repeat things. Um, they usually have great ideas. <laughs> so call on your students to kind of give you that feedback. It's, it's great to hear what they, what they wanna do. Um, also, something else that my kids loved when I was in the classroom, and I can use it also in the online environment, is a wireless doorbell. Um, so there's 35 different chimes on this wireless doorbell that I got from Amazon for 15 bucks. And we use them for transitioning between stations or center time. Um, we also used it for, you know, our cleanup time. Okay, we hear this song every day. That's your signal that we are cleaning up our materials. We need to get back to our seat. We're getting ready for lunch, you know, whatever the case may be. Uh, if you don't have a wireless doorbell, you can use a regular bell, use a song, um, chimes, anything that you have that has that can signal um, a sound for a transition. Kids really take to that very well. The last thing I want to uh, talk about and incorporate is TPR. So this is something I also became more familiar with um, through VIP Kid and teaching online. And this stands for total physical response. This concept is connecting vocabulary with movement and language. So acquiring that language through movement and repeating the language back from the teacher. So pairing that movement and language equals effective learning. So it gets students moving, um, they're hearing the language, they're using the language appropriately, um, and they're pairing it with uh, an appropriate movement or gesture. So this also engages both sides of the brain, the left side and the right side. Um, we know that the left side of the brain is more analytical and methodical thinking. Right side of the brain is more creative and artistic, and it engages both sides of your brain. Um, it's really fun and relaxing, and it's engaging for students. And think when you use TPR, you want to think Dora the Explorer. That's the best way I can explain it from uh, my experience in VIP Kid. You want to be overly animated. Um, you want to have a lot of fun with it, use your gestures, use facial expressions, um, and really get the kids interested and in, involved in it. Um, and I just have some steps here about how to use TPR in your lessons. So you would first perform an action through demonstration and by saying it. So something as simple as I am brushing my teeth. So you can use a prop. So I have a little toothbrush here and you would say it and demonstrate it at the same time. I am brushing my teeth. And then you would call on your students, all of your students at once to repeat it 
and use the um, action with you. So they can do it together, do it with you. Um, and then you would repeat that again with them. And then you would write the verb or the word or the phrase on the board. Um, this is most commonly used with teaching vocabulary. Um, and then you wanna make sure that you're reviewing all of your TPR um, regularly and checking their retention of that TPR. So something else, great physical way to bring in um, those kinesthetic learners, as well as your visual and auditory learners. I included this last slide on here in case any of you teachers have heard of VIP Kid or might be interested in learning more about VIP Kid. Um, so here's just some information if you want to contact me with any questions about it, um, about teaching or applying for VIP Kid, feel free to email me any questions that you have. Um, the website is there. You can set your own schedule with it. There's no lesson planning because VIP Kid provides you the curriculum. So you just get to focus on having fun and doing the one-on-one -on -one teaching with your students. You also get paid to do it. Um, so it's a lot of fun. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. And that's all I have. Great, Samantha. Thank you so much. Um, You're lots of really great information there. I really love that whole idea of the digital rewards. I don't know if everyone got as excited about getting the star as I did, but I was like all in. I'm like, it's sparkling. I, yeah, I'm in. I'm in. Great, great tips. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next, we are going to move to Pallavi. I think you're still muted, Pallavi. I try to remember unmute myself, but again. <laughs> the <laughs> right, struggle is real. I think we've all done it. <laughs> all right then. Good evening, everyone. My name is Pallavi Patel. I'm an occupational therapist. A little something about me is I graduated from OT program in Long Island University, in New York, 2003, and then I ended up going back for my doctorate at Misericordia University and graduated in 2015. Been practicing more than 15 years in a pediatric occupational therapy field. My experience consists of working with the various medically fragile teams and also especially children with autism. So I was working the younger population, but there was a time that for five years, I just predominantly worked with the teenager adults with autism. So a lot more like vocational activities, vocational rehab kind of activities have done it with them. Uh, currently, I own a practice, which is Steps to Success Occupational Therapy. So after having my doctorate, I decided to have my own little place where I can, uh, you know, have more uh, luxury to create my treatment plan, more creative versus working in the school setting or work, working at the home-based setting. And right now I am a provider for CPSC, CSC, and early intervention. I also do private prey and I also take private insurances. I'm also bilingual evaluator and therapist for NASA County and Queens. I speak um, other four languages besides English. So <laughs> that's something I kind of like offer to the community. All right. So something little quick about tele health and occupational therapy. So I know this is a little challenge. It's a really a new um, kind of field for not only for the parents and the caregiver, but as a therapist for us too. I am the last person who is kind of like uh, happily accept any technology changes because I'm just not a technology person. So for as soon as I heard in the March that we are going telehealth, I was the first one who got more worried than the parents and the caregiver whose children were receiving your services. And I was like, I don't know how it's gonna work. But again, kind of like I figured out, this is the way we have to do it. And I'm also kind of person that I really wanted to make sure that the children who are receiving the services, they are kind of continue to see the services and uh, get the benefit of our occupational therapy services. So as you can see, this telehealth for me, how it works was trial and error. And the same thing I explained to the parents, nothing to worry about. This is just gonna be a trial and error. Maybe we'll have one successful session and we'll not have a successful session next time. But just kind of, I told them like, I won't give up on your kid, but you don't give up on me. <laughs> just stay with me and we'll get it done together. And it was kind of like simple and easy at the beginning. But again, as a therapist, we are always flexible 
possible. We are creative. But this was a perfect opportunity for me to work with these parents and show them what the flexibility looks like, what the creativity they can do it at home while doing telehealth, or how adaptively they can use the item they have available at home and use it for the telehealth because during the March and April was complete lockdown where no one was going out of the house, no one was buying the new toys and it was all the sudden. So parents didn't get a chance to like order the stuff at home and they were kind of used to like therapists bringing the toys and activities. So this was like a big change for them, right? Because they would be like, how are we going to do the therapy? We don't have anything at home. All they needed is the Zoom platform an iPhone or the computer and kind of like we assure that we'll walk through you. So the most fun part of the telehealth and occupational therapy was like using all the sensory knowledge that we kind of like have our background with um, using during the treatment time, during the therapy time and kind of like helping parents to ease their anxiety that way the child is also less anxious during the session. So it's not only just you working with the child when you're doing this kind of therapy, you're working with the parents and the caregivers, right? And, and, and as a team, because you don't just want to have a successful OT sessions, you do want to kind of like work as a team, like with SI, with the speech therapist, with the PT, and we kind of like want to work on the same goals. So kind of what I, I would advise to anyone like even having a successful tele sessions, I know sometimes we just kind of like have this, like make it as a fun, make it as a, a real fun for the children and they kind of will be fine during the tele session. But I figured that making fun is good, but yet the session has to be very structured. You can't just like having like just go on a Zoom and oh, like, let's just do this. Let's just, no, you have to have a planned session. You have to have a structured session. How it works in terms of my session that I will do night before, at the beginning, it was a lot of struggle for me because every night I had to sit on the uh, phone and kind of like each individual child, I had to send the family, have the Caesar ready, have the Play-Doh ready, have the paper and pen um, containers ready. And after a few sessions, like parent kind of like really understood like what are the things they needed to have during the session. I'll, I'll keep it aside and we'll make it our life easy. So parent and care education is must, even when we go later later on and talk about the visual and auditory stimulation in terms of sensory feedback, parent and caregiver education plays such an important role. If the parents are educated about the activities we are doing it, they see that this is how it works, they will kind of carry over. So each telesessions, I would suggest like, you know, if we're ending the sessions with the positive note and some kind of carry or activities parents are really this is good for the parents and as a therapist for us to to see like okay some progress we're going to do it why don't we do like uh why don't you today practice just containerizing uh small shapes what you have at home and whatever available they have at home and kind of like seeing next few shares and see if the child has practiced with the parents right so telehealth was kind of like really a new venture for us as a therapist and for the families too adapting visual and auditory stimulations during telehealth that was another challenge because as soon as the parents hear that oh my child has a sensory needs and we're doing telehealth how are you gonna do the sensory how can we do sensory telehealth we can't do it because we are not coming to your office you're not coming to your home how my child is going to get the sensory feedback so this was a real challenge that you know how can we help parents or anywhere you can create the environment that is enriched with the visual and auditory stimulations. So since today we are talking about visual and auditory stimulations, I'll be just focusing on those two sensory aspects. I'm sorry, um, Pallavi, can I interrupt you for one second? Can you just um, make it in the presentation mode so that the slide's a little bit bigger? People are just asking. Sure. I'm sorry to interrupt you. No problem. I'm just trying to see. Is this Perfect. better? Yeah, much better. Thank you. No, that's okay. Thank you. All right. So visual and auditory stimulation or input can often be over or under stimulating for a child with various sensory needs, especially if the child is in a spectrum of autism spectrum disorder. And meeting a child's need is vital for a success, successful telehealth session. So just on a simple word, when you're talking about the stimulation, what is stimulation? Feedback, input some kind of stimulation is something that you do want to use it so child you can get the great productivity you can go more functional outcomes or you can see the growth right because let's talk about like just a teenager if the teenager is starting a work and there is no salary for that work 
there's no stimulation for that work, you won't see the quality of work produced. Same thing with the children. Some children, they probably don't need extra stimulation, but some children, in order for them to work optimally, in order to um, focus, in order to see that growth, you might need to like kind of like stimulate with like extra visual stimulation or auditory stimulation based on their needs. And then think about it, like if we don't understand which kind of stimulation is needed and what will work for one child, how can we create the visual stimulation activities? Because as we all know, every single child is different. Every single child has probably, let's say, visual um, need or children has a proprioceptive need, but not every activity will work with the same kids, right? Some kids will be better with the trampoline or some kids, kids could be just better with jumping on a bed. So each children we are talking about here, we have to have an individual plan for each children in order for us to see the success rate. So talking about visual and auditory stimulation, I kind of make it a little simple, this one, and uh, did the parallel slide, so I guess it's easy for people to see it. Uh, so if you think about the visual uh, area, we have uh, four major categories, visual discrimination, visual figure ground, visual memory, and visual sequencing. So visual dic discrimination, it's kind of thing like when you find out that your child can only focus one thing at a time, he has a hard time. So let's say the puzzle example, if you're giving a puzzle, uh, one to 10 number puzzles, so many pieces, we have a teller session, parents just dump all the pieces on a uh, tray or table. And if we are asking child to find something, it could be very, very hard for that child who has kind of like, you know, visual discrimination difficulty. So we'll be better to like give only two pieces or three pieces at a time and kind of like, you know, see like where the child goes from it. And then you will see the success and eventually you can grade, grade that and you can, you know, add on to it. Same thing with visual, um, visual figure ground. If you have kind of like box of the ABC puzzle and number puzzle, mix it together. If you're working with the child on visual discrimination or any of the visual perceptual skill, but if the child has a difficulty in the area of visual physical ground, will have very difficult time to get successful in this activity because it's too much going on there and finding just the letter A or number one will be too much. So you do want to like condense that activity, just have a fewer pieces, three or four pieces and have, have, give the success to the child, have the child learn that activity first, let the parents see like this child can be successful by doing this, if, you know, kind of like teach that uh, skill to the parents as well. Visual memory where kind of like, you know, you might have to repeat yourself or as Samantha said before, that's perfect for like using this kind of schedule. So kind of like the child is not looking forward for let's say some kind of like a writing activity, but you can always make it like, okay, let's do first the tabletop. We have a second, you can take a little break and then, you know, you can have a writing or like, you know, kind of preferred activity versus non-preferred activity. You can uh, also depends on the child. If the child you think that is not able to sustain the session for very long, you want to make it just a three or even just like simply first and then that's it. Two activity, first this, then this, all done, reinforce and goodbye. If you feel like the child is trained, you can kind of like adding three, four, and kind of eventually you kind of like build up with this year. So another thing is with visual stimulation, this could be also very, very visually stimulated if the child is oversensitive um, over in the visual uh, area. In that case, you wanna make something simple like the small booklets where child cannot see like all the choices you have at the same time, versus just like, it's a simple thing, like one thing, are you finished? Check. Next activity is the coins. Are you finished? Check. So this is a little bit like less um, over visual. Uh, children with over visual, visual stimulation could be overly stimulated with this kind of activity. So you rather want to use this one because this is kind of like narrow down to them. And then visual sequencing, same concept. Like you do want to like for those learners to kind of have a sequence. Like we have one, two, three, four, or first this, second this, kind of like you want to help them with the sequencing. So they kind of like see the end result and kind of that could also reinforce them to complete the session or complete the given task. Similar kind of things we'll talk in the auditory. 
So same thing with the auditor discrimination. We were just talking about, um, I think it was Sandy, a uh, quiet spot or speaking or slower heart. So you have a lot of noise going on, like and which one you want to focus, which one you don't, you know, you have to like kind of filter out. We as an adult even sometimes have a hard time. So think about the children, so special need, especially the children on the spectrum of autism. It could be too overstimulating for them also in terms of auditory, or it could be just like too under aroused and they don't kind of like even filter any information and they it looks like they are kind of like withdrawn because they're just not getting that input or they're not just understanding at all. So in those kind of children with auditory discrimination, you want to make sure it's a quiet spot. So they kind of like discriminate like certain noise versus like, you know, selective noise that will, they really need to hear your instructions. You do want to make sure like either you're speaking a little slow or a little higher pitch so they kind of like, you know, focus on you. Auditory memory and auditory sequencing, same thing with the memory also. Like in visual memory, you wanna use something like this so they can see and kind of remember. Same thing with auditory memory, you wanna repeat the step again. They might have a hard time like remembering the instruction you gave like, like multiple steps. So you do wanna say if you're doing the obstacle course and if you have a jumping, hopping and climbing, you do wanna like remind them after two steps, like let's do jumping, let's do climbing and let's do hopping. And just a simple, it doesn't have to be like too much like linguistic, like an involvement there, like just the simple steps. Um, same thing with the sequencing. If they really have a sequencing difficulty, you use a lot of training with like simple games or like just give them steps by steps directions. And that goes with the family also, because sometimes I feel like even in telehealth, I noticed that family was having a hard time to follow because we'll tell something to do it. And the parents like definitely picking another activity or presenting to the child. And we'll be like, no, mommy, remember we decided to do Play-Doh and then coloring. <laughs> so kind of things like, you know, the, those are the simple things like as a normal individual, we also kind of implement on our life. Going back to the visual stimulation, and I'll be a little quick on this one because Samantha has covered some of the stuff. So just as an OT perspective, um, giving more focus on to this part, like you do have a two kind of children children are oversensitive to the visual stimulation and undersensitive to the visual stimulation. I would say instead of just jumping on like, oh, this is a sensory child. He can have this, he can have this. You really have to analyze your child. You also have to educate your parents because parents sometimes hear something and they feel like, oh, my child needs the weighted vest. Oh, my child needs the trampoline, you know? But we really have, we are, that's what we are here for. We kind of like really analyze the child and make the individual plan where they can be have a successful Method telehealth or uh, sensory um, diet or anything that we kind of like, you know, want to have it with these children. So, if you have a child really with the oversensitivities, you already diagnosed it, you already have it, now your medicine is ready, you can have a sensory diet plan where you can kind of like have the activities that can help with their oversensitivities. So, if they're oversensitive, that means like having the bright screen even on, a, on their tablet or the computer could be like, like very hard for them to focus during the telehealth. Sometimes like constant eye contact or having like too close to the screen, us as a therapist could be very like, you know, they, they could be like shut down for that. So you do want to make sure like simple tips, like, you know, the screen is like dim, uh, dec decrease some of the background distractions, which is like if, you're, if your table is set up next to the window, there are children who kind of stims on like looking at the trees. Like so many kids I have seen if they're stimming on the trees or they're stimming on the leaves or they're stimming on the sun or sunlight. So you do want to kind of like keep that in mind. Like you, you kind of like relocate the therapy. Um, uh, like if it's using the table or the high chair or whatever, you're using it or you're playing it. Uh, you want to also make sure like if the floor, the floor that you're using it is kind of like a unitone, not too colorful because overly stimulated child could be like more overly stimulated and it will be hard for them to focus and kind of like, you know, stay to the uh, therapy sessions. And you do want to do a little bit like break in between so let's say they're like overly stimulated so you can use something like this kind of like really nice like you know um a little visual um, uh, cues kind of thing like i have seen this is like very effective during my telehealth because most of the children if i'm losing them if they're they really hyper they're losing it uh they're not staying on the task once i take this out they kind of like come back and i i don't say anything i just put this on the um, kind of camera and they just kind of like you know it really helps them to like just to calm down and settle down and then we kind of like introduce the next task so looking at the under sensitivity opposite kids that we talk about so these kids are like kind of like more 
under, they are like under aroused. We really need to wake them up or we need to have some kind of stimulation so we can get the optimal feedback from that. So for this one, you want to do like a little bit more bright color, introduce something with like, you know, lightning area, not too dim. Um, same thing with the objects that you're using it. I think Samantha said like, great. I love those using like um, teddy bears or pops. Those are the best for this kind of children also, especially with the bright color. I think I had, that was a pink teddy bear. So you also think about like which prop you're giving. You don't want to put just like a brown or like light white or something like, you know, very like dull color teddy bear that the child has no interest or like polar bear you want to like really have an attractive color fluorescent color where you can catch child's attention another thing with samantha i really like that um, the one you mentioned for those um, visual slides where you have the shiny stars so if you're selecting those kind of like um, reinforcement that shiny star could be perfect for this kind of under sensitive child because it's a star it's bright and it was shiny Versus with the children with oversensitivity, you don't want to use those kind of star. You know, you can, you may want to like just use like a simple, you know, plain color stars. But perfect example, I just figured that and you just sewed it to them. So let me just get um, that one. So some kind of like light up toys, something more spinning those spinning fidgety toy those are great i have something here this toy most of my tele sessions i would say like in april this was my successful choice so it's kind of like a little bit spinning thing and i never thought this toy is going to help me really a lot with my tele session but it perfectly worked out like i kind of like took one at a time and like have the children like look at me and then two and three and then i'll catch the kids attention for like five minutes and then i can easily move on to the next activity so something like that you really want to do it because there's a lot of visual stimulation going on spinning and rotatory moment things like the popcorn activity some of the folder tasks i'm pretty sure you guys have done it too so i kind of also do like this like a white and black background so this is kind of also like very clear but like it's very stimulating for the children who kind of have a lot of difficulty with too much colorful background of the puzzles and everything. These are all the tasks most of my family, I helped them to make during the pandemic time. So that's why my telehealth session kind of like went very well because this stuff was very easy to make it at home too. And there's some more stuff like a pen and lights and a, a pen that has a lightning for fine motor tasks and things like that. So these are some of just the example, I, what I just showed it to you guys, like, you know, some of the visual activities, like shoe basket task, folder task, um, very good, like example of it. Same thing we just went over. Um, the cues that we have it for wait, finish, sit down. And again, as we work as a team, so with the speech and SI, we kind of like really want to see like if the SI is working on like finish or like more or, you know, wait, we want to also incorporate as an OT using our visual stimulation and auditory stimulations during our therapy session. And real quick about auditory stimulation. So for auditory stimulation, same thing I have divided in. You guys will have this slide so you guys can, you know, kind of like really read. And if you have any question, anytime you guys can reach out to me. So with same thing with the oversensitivity, you just want to make sure that it's not too much for this child. So you do want to use like an ear, um, earmuff, headphone. You want to position the child away from the door so he's not constantly hearing those noises and not getting distracted. Because sometimes we assume that child is not interested in our therapy not necessarily it could be like those stimulation that he is getting distracted with he could be distracted by the noise or like lawn mower or the cars going back and forth it's not our session it could be some of those like sensory needs are not met and that's why child is not able to sustain during the session right mm -hmm. so you don't want to use also so like calming music kind of thing waterfall so this is also really works if you can find it one with the little like those waterfall noise, it really works very well. Like it's kind of visual and it's kind of like auditory too. Uh, you don't wanna make sure like the rugs or anything you're using, it is mostly padded. So you, it's not too much noise during the tele session so child won't get distracted. And same thing with the under sensitivities, you wanna make sure that you have a nice, you know, singing works best also. So use a lot of songs, clapping, like if the child is really doing well, just clap very hard, like, yay, good job. And you'll be able to bring the child's attention. That's a great auditory feedback for the child's ear and great reinforcer. Using a lot of like sensory cubes, sensory tubes, um, Piano games are best, uh, especially piano game. I like it because it's an auditory feedback, but also I incorporate a lot of upper extremity strengthening exercises like touch this, touch that, you know, step on this, stamp on this, things like that. 
And these are some just example of like auditory um, uh, stimulation. The child is really using bilateral activities, strengthening activities, but it's kind of like really giving auditory feedback. So this child is all over the place, but kind of like right now he's more stable because he's getting that feedback, what he needs it. And I was able to engage him in the activities. And same thing with accordion tube is our best <laughs> friend for the auditory sensory feedback. And there are a few more. And that's about it. I know I went a bit fast. I had so much to offer, but again, if you have any question, uh, I know I'm always open, email me. If the parents are here on this um, webinar today, feel free to reach out to any question we can help you with. And that's about it. That's great. Thank you so much, Pallavi. That was a lot of really great information. I feel like um, we can all have a better understanding of that visual and auditory stimulation to be able to apply it for sure. Um, we are going to move now to Brittany. Um, so I'm Brittany Shear. I teach at Wyoming Valley Children's Association in 44. It is my second year teaching there. I teach preschoolers between the ages of three and five with an autism diagnosis. Um, I am a part of the Patan Autism Initiative Verbal Behavior Classroom. And um, two years prior to that, I taught in Alaska in a preschool room um, for English as a second language. So our classroom is very, very hands-on. So I did bring home a lot of my manipulatives to kind of show you what we use for auditory and visual stimulation in our classroom. Um, so with teaching preschoolers, we are big on singing. There is always singing going on in our room. So for a file folder activity, which I'll show you here. So we have the cat and the hat, where you match uppercase to lowercase letters. And as we're doing this, we're not only having the kids match letter M, and put it where it belongs. As they're doing that, we steal um, songs such as the Letter Factory to sing the M says mm, the M says mm, to bring in that auditory as they're visually putting it where it goes. When it comes to colors, um, every color has a song. So I have works that are just matching the fish to the fishbowl where it belongs. So if they're matching the orange fish, we're singing along O-R-A-N-G-E. And if they are ready, they can write orange with a dry erase board marker right on the uh, paper. So then they can point along to letters O-R-A-N-G-E, orange is what that spells. And even when they're coloring, sometimes I know there's quiet silence as they're writing or they're coloring with a certain color, they can sing the color song or we sing it to them. Um, since a lot of our room, a good majority of the students come in um, nonverbal or with very little communication or words. So it's kind of our job to incorporate all the vocabulary into their day for them. During our circle time, we sing more songs um, and we use a lot of visuals. So if I was singing Old MacDonald Had a Farm, I'd leave in the blanks for them to fill in. So I'd say, Old MacDonald Had a Farm, yeah, yo. And on his farm, he had a, hold it up. They say cat, put the cat, oh, ooh. That went fine. Um, put the cat on the board and then have somebody come up and write the word cat. And you can even expand on that by having them write meow for the cat. And this was something I also did during um, the pandemic when we were virtual. We are now back in session, but when we were virtual, it was kind of hard to get preschoolers really engaged in this. So I as I had at the pieces and was holding them up as we were going, um, the kids were getting really excited to learn and have them on the board and go along with the song um, to make it as interactive as we really could at that time. During our circle time, we always read a story. So as we're doing the story, I point along to the words so they can see exactly what's being said. And since a lot of our kids are unable to um, tell me what's in the photos, I will sit here and I'll describe what's going on. David, be quiet. What's David doing? Oh, he's banging on the pot. Bang on your knee. Show me how we do that. To bring in the different sounds and to kind of elaborate more on what's going on in the story to better understand it and give them the vocabulary so when they do become more vocal, they have that vocabulary, can associate words with what's going on. Um, during our calendar time, we'll sing songs with the days of the week and the months of the year by touching our body parts. Um, pointing to it on our actual calendar, following along as we go, having another student come up and point to, okay, look, here's Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, oh, here's Friday to associate, you know, Sunday's the beginning of the week, Friday's towards the end of the week. 
Um, one cool thing our school does do is we team up with um, students from Marywood University and their clinical director is a part of the Back Mountain Music Therapy Group. And they come into our room once a week um, and provide music therapy for our students, which is wonderful. Um, they'll bring in manipulatives such as if they're singing Five Little Monkeys, they have their drum. Instead of saying Five Little Monkeys jumping on the bed, everybody gets a stuffed animal and Five Little Monkeys are bouncing on the drum. Um, they have song books that they use that the students create that have, um, for example, they take the wheels on the bus and change it to uh, the letters of the alphabet say and the different sounds with the letter picture. They use a lot of manipulatives to show the students as they're verbally saying it as the auditory aspect, they're vis visually showing it for the students. A big chunk of our room involves play. Play is huge in a preschool setting. So a lot of the play, if our students are not yet saying words or signing a lot of words, it's a lot of our staff members basically being sports broadcasters. We're sitting there talking about what's going on. So if they're playing with blocks and they're stacking the blocks, we're talking about, oh, you put the pink block on the green block. Oh, on the pink block, there's flowers. You're pointing out every little aspect of what's going on in the room, being that broadcaster to provide, you know, a play-by-play -play of what's happening to hear what's going on. Um, we also do a huge dramatic theme area uh, for each kind of season or what's happening. So currently in our room, we have a big apple tree where students can Velcro different color apples on the tree and we have bins where they can sort them and put them in place. So they can put the green, the red, and the yellow apples on the tree, pull them off and put them in the bin that's labeled. And as they're doing that, we're talking about, you know, apples have seeds, apples come off the tree, there's different color apples. Um, we even have an area where they can make apple pies using felt, and pie tins and fake apples to put in the pie. Um, so it's very, a lot of hands-on with labeling, the sorting, the fine motor, um, using that everyday vocabulary and building off of the knowledge that they already know. Um, for example, last year we did a pumpkin patch in the fall and we had a, um, a cash register where you had to buy a ticket to get into the corn maze or to pick up the pumpkins. So a lot of the students got to see how you go through a pumpkin patch to prepare them for every day aspects so when they go if their family does take them to the pumpkin patch they are able to know how the whole transition happens as well as you know be able to hear the words visualize what's going to happen when they get there um, another big thing um, i know it was already kind of mentioned was um, the daily schedule pictures in our room with having preschoolers it's a little bit harder to picture our entire schedule that's a lot for the kids so we do the first then boards so usually the first thing is an activity that this really isn't a preferred activity. So like our uh, cat and hat letter match, if they do that, then we can do the fun bubbles that everyone loves. We also do different uh, ways to communicate. So like I said, not all of our students have vocal communication. They use signs or they use pictures. So anytime we're in the classroom, if I'm saying, oh, you want more? I'm signing and saying the word to give them the visual as well as the verbal. Um, bubbles, you want bubbles? And some of our kids as well use a picture board to communicate. So we have a bunch of different pictures of things, whether it's pretzels, trips, Swedish fish. We give them a small amount of choices where if that's something they want, here you go, they give it to me and I say, oh, you want the pretzels, here's the pretzels. Um, that's their form of communication. Or if they have a device, they can easily click it and will say, you know, I want cookies. Oh, here's the cookies, good job. Always, it's a lot of repetition. Um, repeating is what's being said. So even if they can't verbally say it, if they're signing it, I'm still repeating when they give me that, what they have said or what they want. Um, so if I'm teaching them how to communicate and I'm holding up a block and I'm sitting there and they see it and I say, block, block, they say it, the moment they say it, they get it, wonderful, we did it. Um, so a lot of ours is very hands-on and I have most of my manipulatives here to kind of show you what we use in our classroom. And I'm, um, I hope I've provided you all with some helpful ideas or information. I'm very thankful to be a part of this webinar. Thanks, guys. Great. Thank you so much, Brittany. That was some really great tips. I, and I love how practical they were, showing us how you're using them. Um, so let me go back to this other view. All right, so that's the end of our panel pre presentation. Um, if 
there are anyone that's watching that has questions, please feel free to type that right into the chat box and I will be happy to ask the panelists. Um, I do have a few questions here. Um, the first one, I would say probably either Brittany or Sam might be best to answer, um, but maybe even Pallavi, you could weigh in on this. Um, so some of you were showing um, some manipulatives like that they would be using, like for example, um, just because it was last and now I remember it is like the cat, like you were showing the picture of the cat. Would the students um, have those manipulatives at home? Like, is it something that you would maybe, you know, email to the parents and they would have them prepared? Or do you keep the manipulatives all kind of on your side of the virtual teaching? So when I when we went virtual, I did make um, baggies for the kids that wanted Zooms and that were doing the direct teaching with me um, of all the materials that they needed for the instruction. So if we were going to use a whiteboard, I had a whiteboard for them. I had the magnetic pieces. I had any type of manipulatives they need already ready for them. And a lot of it was stuff I either made so it was very inexpensive or you could get it at the Dollar Tree. So it wasn't like we were going, you know, a million dollars here. We were creating it on our own, printing off papers, laminating, using Velcro file folders. It was very simple things, but very interactive and fun things that the students enjoyed. That's great. Sam, would you, would, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, absolutely. No, I agree too. Um, and I think with being flexible, you know, if the students have access to be able to, you know, print the materials that you might uh, email to them or send to them, um, but being flexible, if they don't have access to being able to print or use um, the props in class, just having them watch you use your props and having them maybe repeat after you some of the things that you're pointing out um, with the props, um, that's still engaging them uh, with using it and seeing it um, and listening to you so I think you know as long as you're flexible um, using the props you know in, in a couple different ways whatever works for you and your students is is great. Great. Pallavi anything additional to add? Yes just to add on to so for me from the OT perspective I do a lot of like a hand motor function so I did a lot of like a shoe boxes task which was a great hit because every parent had the shoe boxes in the house they had the cereal boxes in the house they had the pasta boxes in the house so I just don't have it here handy I wish I would had it and uh, take it but what I kind of like did it like I will uh, draw the things that I want parents to do it and simply at home they're just like drawing circle square triangle and they're using the pasta box and cut out the circle square triangle let's say they don't have any puzzles at home and then they take another shoe box just the empty shoe box and kind of like cut out the mold on the circle square triangle and we just like matching and we're putting so it's a great fine motor same thing like a lot of container those like uh, Chinese food that we order like white clear container make a hole put all the pigs what I did other way like first week of telehealth I told the parents to take a picture of whatever they have at home in terms of their choice some parents will be like oh we're not too organized we have everything all over I said I don't care just take a picture of that area and send it to me so I kind of did it like whatever they have it and uh, help them create like individual activities so we, I really didn't want them to stress out for going out and buying things and thinking about this thing won't work but there's so much things like you can do it I have so much activities we could have an like, separate webinar for that <laughs> but yes yeah, that's how it worked and it kind of like you know worked out pretty good like you know yeah. And same thing with the abstract course or any strengthening exercise, we'll be using like pillows or the scarves at the ha uh, home, whatever they have it available, using the scotch tape and making some shapes on the floor and jumping on the circle, jumping on the triangle, drawing with the chalk and doing any kind of like those fine motor activities and gross motor. Wow. Yeah, well, I said one thing I think in the forefront is it's showing how creative educators are and how resourceful. I mean, we, we can do a lot with uh, Dollar Tree items, that is for sure. All right, here's my, um, here's my next question. How, um, how can I help to engage a student who struggles with organization um, in a virtual setting? Uh, Sam, do you have thoughts on that one? Flavio, I'll come to you next. Yeah, sure. So I think with students who struggle with their organizational skills, um, 
I like color coding as a teacher, personally. <laughs> color coding things for students really is simplistic for them. Um, it's easy to associate for them. So if you can color code things throughout your lessons or by subject area or your picture cards, um, color coding, I think, is a great simple way to really help organize. Um, also, just being consistent with um, your lessons and how you're presenting things. Um, I would say be consistent in how you present your, your topics and your lessons and be more creative in the activities that you do to reinforce those concepts or the topics. So they, they know what to expect when you're um, in a session or in a lesson um, because it's consistently uh, the same format, but you can be creative in those activities that you, you choose to do that will reinforce concepts for them. That's great. Pallavi, you, you had something to add? Just to add on, like color coding is like, um, you know, one of the fantastic ways. You can also like number them like one, two, three, four. So that kind of like really also gives the child very in terms of sequencing and organizing. And we just spoke about uh, visual sequencing or auditory sequencing. The child has kind of like in terms of sensory way, you know, kind of need in that area. You do want to make sure like the pictures in the sequence and order and that could be like organism skills. And again, depends like which organizing you know, where the child having a difficulty organizing the desk, organizing, um, um, I don't know, the bedtime or morning routine depends on that, you know, always the therapist and the educator can help like, you know, create a sequencing plan for the child. Uh, and that, uh, that really works. That's great. Um, excuse my dog barking in the background. Sorry about that. Um, Brittany, anything to add or do you feel like they kind of covered? Okay, good. All right, next one. Um, Oh, this is actually, I think, really important. How can I encourage a student who's reluctant to participate? I think that you showed a lot of great ways to keep their intention, but we also want them to be participating too. Um, thoughts on that? Yeah, I have some ideas for that. So I know students can maybe be shy, especially in this new, you know, computer Zoom kind of classroom now um, that they're experiencing. So sometimes they don't like to see themselves on the screen. Um, it's like looking in a mirror the whole time and that kind of makes me a little uneasy. <laughs> so I would say sometimes, you know, maybe give uh, them the option to turn off their camera so they just see the teacher kind of pin that teacher teacher um, video so that they only see the teacher, they don't see the other children, um, they don't see themselves. Also, if they're a little uncomfortable, maybe having them use one of their stuffed animals, um, bring in their props so that they can use their animal to talk for them or to do something for them so they're not the ones put on the spot. Maybe, you know, Teddy is the one that has to do the activity and they have to, you know, demonstrate it. Um, so kind of getting creative uh, with having them use props, maybe maybe you would have a day where they could, you know, wear a mask, their Batman mask uh, to class and they can do their activities in their Batman mask because maybe that will make them feel more comfortable or more confident in their class. Um, so just helping them to, you know, feel more comfortable. Um, giving them some choices, you know, do you want to do it this way or do you want to do it that way? Do you want to use a whisper voice to do this activity? Um, do you want to use your robot voice? So giving them, you know, the choices, let them choose some of the activities. Um, so those might just be some different ways that, that will kind of engage them and, and allow them to be confident in participating. Excellent, I love those ideas. Go ahead, Pallavi. Just to be add on quickly, same thing, like shouldn't be very intimidated. We don't want to put the child on the spot and totally understandable, every kids are different. So what I did it in the beginning, some of the children were there, like will not stay for the session or will not come up. I asked the parents like what kind of toys they have it. I kind of like found the similar toys in my side and kind of like, oh, I found this teddy bear. Logan, do you have something like this? You wanna go find it for me? If he doesn't come, he doesn't come, doesn't matter. But I told the parents like, well, we'll still have a continuous session for consistently every week. And in, within a second session or third session, child realizes like, oh, this is something for me and the Pilates is here to play with me. And it just becomes very natural. So we really don't want to impose on a child, but we want to keep the sessions consistently. And that's also something I would say, even as a uh, educator, it our job to you know, tell parents that please be consistent because consistency is very important. Like don't give up. If one child didn't show up, doesn't mean the telehealth is not working or the session is not working for any reason. 
Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, it, it's you know, it's a it's kind of a whole a whole new thing for most people. So definitely giving giving yourself time, cutting yourself a little bit of a break, giving time for things you know to work out, um, and for the you know the kids to get used to it also. I think I think the message in our last webinar we kept saying like it's so important just to to be kind to yourself during this time, you know that everyone is is kind of in the same boat, and I think that that really carries over. Um, I don't see any more questions now um, in our chat box that I have. Um, Sandy, did you want to maybe talk? I know that we have some discussion groups and some additional webinars that are coming up. Did you want to talk about those? Sure, sure. Um, for anyone who's watching this um, or is live or who watches um, the recording that will be up hopefully by tomorrow night, uh, <laughs> The next two weeks, so next Wednesday and the Wednesday after at six o'clock, um, so that is the 16th, I think, and the 23rd, um, we are having, rather than webinars, so we've been spending a lot of time with our panelists talking to you, now this is your chance to talk to each other. Because um, as we've seen just in the, the different panelists that we've had for the last two weeks, um, the people who have the best ideas are the people who are doing this every day. And we thought um, having a discussion group so that you as educators can come, uh, talk to each other, share ideas, share, you know, what's working, what's not working, because what is not working for you might be something that someone else has an idea for. Um, so those discussion groups, you do need to sign up for them and you do need to provide a little more information because we do want to make sure that it is educators. Um, although the ideas and, you know, we definitely support parents in what they're going through right now. Um, we wanted to provide just a place for educators to talk to each other. Um, so those discussion groups will not be recorded but my goal is is that I will take notes <laughs> during the discussion group and hopefully be able to type up um, some posts and things for the Facebook group so that if you can't make it to the discussion group um, that you'll still be able to get some of the ideas that we'll be able to share them. Um, both discussion groups next week and the week after we decided not to separate it out by grade or anything so you can come to one or both um it it doesn't matter and then the last um wednesday of the month september 30th um we're very excited to have uh a person who is, his name is Chris Bonello, and he is an autistic educator. So he is, um, he is diagnosed, he was actually diagnosed later in life um, as autistic, and he also was, is a, was a, an elementary school teacher by trade. And he, since he now no longer teaches, but he does do tutoring and um, just uh, speeches, uh, motivational talks, et cetera, instructional talks um, as a self-advocate um, for autism. So we're very excited to talk to him from an autistic perspective on, you know, we have all these great ideas, um, but to actually hear from someone who can give us that perspective from the inside and here's what a child with autism may be experiencing through all of this, um, we think is just really valuable. So we hope you will be able to join us uh, for that webinar as well. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of exciting things. I, I am, I'm truly looking forward to those discussion groups. I feel like we'll get a lot of really great ideas um, through them. Um, I do see one more question popping up here. Uh, do you do any webinars or meetings with parents who are willing to tell their stories and can share what has worked for them and their children, which can help the teachers learn strategies as well? Um, 
I guess I would say, Sandy, that we haven't, but I mean, I, I certainly think that would be a, a great yeah. opportunity. That's a great idea. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think that's actually a, a really good um, kind of lead into something that I wanted to say, which is, you know, our, our goal, mine and Sandy's goal is to find topics that are relevant and important right now. Um, you know, as a former educator, um, I hate to say former because I feel like I still want to have my hands in it somewhere, but um, I want to be able to give families and educators and everyone who is touching um, the lives of people with autism the tools that they need. And, and I think that Sandy and I both agree that we don't have all the answers, but what we're willing to do is try to find the experts who might have some. So if you have any ideas, um, you know, anyone that's watching, um, if any ideas of topics of webinars that you think would be valuable either to you yourself or to other people, um, we would always appreciate that information. So I, I think that idea of, you know, having parents kind of weigh in on the strategies that work for them is an excellent one and certainly one that we will, that we will look into. Yeah, and definitely if, um, you know, we have parents participating tonight and if you would be interested in participating in a panel um, presentation like this, but with parents, definitely um, send us a message um, because we'd love to put something like that together. Yeah, so I'm just going to share my screen here. Um, this is all of our contact information. Um, so this is this is me, um, the Autism Center at Misericordia, um, my email address, our Facebook page. Um, this is Sandy's information, the Hazelton Autism Family Support Hub. Um, again, her email address, her Facebook page, and then this is the Facebook page for the Autism Educator Support Alliance. Um, so any you know information after watching this webinar that you would like to have additional information or any ideas that you have for future webinars webinars, you can reach out to one or both of us. Um, please join our Facebook groups. Um, we're trying to put out as much, you know, positive information as we can. And other than that, thank you. I guess we can just say thanks for joining us tonight and we look forward to hopefully seeing you again um, and working with you. That's